All right, James Coley, welcome to the show, my friend. I'm looking forward to this, and I think we have this on the calendar now for a couple of weeks or so. I'm excited to interview you and how you've really grown your business and created some serious scale out of the operation you've built. So before we get into how you did that, can you just share with everyone your background and how did you get into real estate off the jump? Background is I was a firefighter. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't know. See, I don't know much about you. This is going to be a good interview. <laughs> yeah, I've been to Iraq into Afghanistan. It's my why. I'm not all about show. Do I want money? Do I need money? But yeah, I fell into it. I was working my fire ship. I finally made it back home. I saw this guy kept walking around, started becoming friends with him. He told me he had a couple of properties. I'm like, hey, you know what? Let me do that. So I did it. We went down to the local bar and we sat there and we drank. We wrote on a napkin, our business plan. I, I kid you not. We said we we're going to do 30 deals in the first year. We did it in three months. Holy smokes. We burned the boats. I quit my fire gig. I did everything and we dove all the way. Now we're on year number eight. I got a team of 18. We will do probably close to 200 deals again this year. We did 88 flips last year with just over 100 wholesale deals. And then the real exciting part is we're starting to lighten our home guys. So our vision when we first started doing this business was our business name is Home Guy. And then so we're the Minnesota Home Guy. It was a name that you could take and put it in any city. You can be Dallas Home Guys. I was on another podcast and this guy's reached out to me, happened to be a firefighter also. And so now we have Knoxville Home Guys. They just started doing all their stuff. About two weeks ago, they went 100% live. They're doing the exact same business that we're doing. So I'm underwriter right now because I really need to make sure they succeed. So basically, they reached out for coaching. I turned them around and said, this is my idea about the home guys stuff. And we're running with it. You built a brand out of everything. Correct. That's what we were trying to do. So if you go to homeguys.com, we're in, still in the process of building it up. But that was nice about them being able to come on. They were actually able to jump on our SEO stuff. And so I already have a proven eight years already. So that's part of what you get when you join us. Yeah, you're basically investing into momentum versus trying to start it off the scratch. And that's how we ended up getting them, to be honest with you, was, hey, I can coach you guys through all of this. I can't physically give you my information. But what if I did? Yeah. And how do you think that would look? And then we just talked through it and we just came up with a structured plan. And one of our heavy things, what we do, I know we're jumping into it, is we're heavy on TV. Okay. Are you using Tony for TV? Who do you use for TV? Ironically, yeah, we're using Tony. Uh, Tony's okay. part of my investor field group. Are you on there? Where are I you am. at? I'm in there too. I just don't show up to the meetings. Yeah, yeah. I'm a phantom person. I operate over the internet. I sit up here in my cave in the Lake Tahoe area. I just haven't gone in a while, but I've been investor fuel for Jesus, probably six years now. So. Oh, are you one of the original guys? I think I went to the second meeting, maybe the third okay. meeting. I wasn't at the first inception meeting, but that's a great group of great people in there. It's one of the better groups that I've run across. I've run yeah. across a couple other ones. So let me ask you this now, as we start to get into the meat and potatoes, I want to cover the licensing thing first, because that's where we started the conversation. Then I'm going to get into that. How did you actually do the deals and whatnot. And then we'll cover TV as well. The licensing model. Now, are you a partner with these people or are you just getting a kind of like a royalty residual? Yep. The way it's set up, it's a lot less than all those other guys, but we wanted to go more of the licensing versus the franchising. There's a lot more restrictions. Basically, it says don't tarnish the name. If you tarnish the name and you don't hit these goals, then we take it away and give it to somebody else. So yeah. it's pretty simple on that side of it. That's interesting because the franchising, like I said, I'll just mention one name here. So Homevestor. Probably the one I would talk about the most. That was a big franchise franchise a couple years ago and they had a blue ocean basically wide open market and a lot of people were joining them and there are still people involved there but if you don't buy a house that month or any month you have to pay them a fee even if you don't buy a house so their incentive was not really in a line with the operator and they were making it seem like you need us because we know how to do the marketing and now marketing is literally like you could find out how to do marketing on the internet now you could just look it up and this is back when there wasn't that much information so a lot of people actually exited home back to do their own thing. And now I don't believe Homevestors is nearly as big as it once was because they just didn't have their incentive lined up with the actual client, in this case, the franchisee. So it's smart you're doing this licensing deal where you know it's more like upside. So now that you brought it up, that's exactly what we modeled against it. It's what we wanted to also do is we wanted to make it super simple. We didn't want how many hands in the cookie jar. There's room for people to grow and not get frustrated. I, I don't want to be the only one taking the money. Especially in this business where it's so transactional, it's very hard to sell. Like the best exit. Right. Is honestly a licensing deal, which is smart that you're doing that because you're scaling in a very intelligent way. So you just mentioned before that, that did 200 houses in one calendar year, which is very difficult to do. And it's an amazing achievement. Let me ask you this first, because you have a bigger team than me. I have four full-time people. You have 18. When you start scaling, obviously the revenue will go way up, right? Because it's just the way it is when you scale. What type of margins should somebody expect if they're scaling at, at the capacity you're at? Because obviously when the revenue goes up, the expenses are also going to go up with mostly advertising costs. So 
when is it worth it to do it? Because I have some friends who've scaled big and made it work. And I have some friends who've scaled big and their margins have pretty much diminished. So I think we're in a business now, at least where I'm at, where, yeah, we're in the seven figure mark, but I'm also in a pretty high margin because of my lower overhead. But you've been there, done that. So that's been something I've been avoiding because I've seen other people do it the wrong way and clearly you've done it the right way. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. There was a period of time as you're scaling where you're making money, you're making money, but you're throwing it back in. Yeah. You got to throw this much more money out of to, to get over that hump. I know exactly what you're talking about because it's hard to tell you what kind of numbers to look for because it all depends. I see some guys running a really lean team and I'm like, holy crap. Crap, how do they make those numbers? I know our numbers are so solid. That was the one thing that we wanted to do from the beginning is make sure we had good books. I understand what you're talking about, but you're right. You have to do it correctly. Because again, I know people who make a lot more money that do less and they don't have to worry about all the headaches. But can their business run without them? It can't. That's the downside. So honestly, we just let our COO go. He was with us for three years. He got us to a different level. Again, he was a good guy. I don't want to take anything away from him on that side, but he grew the business to where it needed to go. And then that was it. So that was the perfect spot where we were at, where we could scale, but we could leave the business and not have to worry about it. Now I'm jumping back in, but I'm working on the license stuff. Yeah, I'm moving forward with that. We're doing more of a collaboration, not have a COO anymore. Basically you get two people that agree upon what should we do with it? Do we wholesale it one way or do we flip it the other? And if they agree upon it, let's keep moving. And so I have higher up management people now. My business partner can pretty much rule and say, hey, this is what we're going to do. But I want to make it a collaboration of the team. Oh, 100%. I learned that from Ray Dalio in his book, Principles. He really teaches about that. Now he's grown his investment business. So that's a really good point that you mentioned. And the takeaway for the listeners is you're going to scale. You have to scale with purpose and with intention because I know more people that have scaled into the gutter because of the lack of intention. And they just keep getting more revenue, but their overhead goes up and they don't have good management systems in place. And now they're working harder technically in their business because they think they're scaling it, but you did it the right way. You set the processes up off the bat to where you can do it effectively. Now you're doing it in the licensing model. So it's very impressive, especially in this type of business. Cause I tell a lot of my friends, this, like, this is a business that's very tricky because it's very transactional. There's a lot of things that are out of your control that can block your revenue, i.e. title issues, sellers changing their mind, buyers ghosting you at the last minute. My rental business, I'm getting paid every month, no matter what, but the flipping business, it can get wavy sometimes, which is why I like to pick off rentals to keep for my own personal wealth. But you mentioned the TV and the marketing, and I want to cover that because I want to keep the audience here. So TV is obviously working for you. I'm going to make an assumption on TV and I want you to just confirm or correct me. I would assume TV is obviously expensive because it is mass media. However, I see the lead quality quality being fairly strong because that message on the TV media, I think it hits a certain demographic pretty well. I would assume you get pretty qualified people who understand what the whole deal is, which would ultimately make it a profitable channel because the lead quality I can see being pretty high despite that relatively high marketing expense every month. You are correct. I will tell you having incoming calls that they want to sell your house versus trying to do cold calling, it brings culture down. I learned from a couple of different people out there the path of least resistance is the yep. way to go. We're a little different here in the Midwest. People get mad and call us back and say, can you please never send us another mailing? We, we're not going to sell our house to you. Don't send your mailings to us. Again. In the New York area, you get much different language than please take me off your list. You get, I'm going to come to your office and hit you with a pitchfork type of people. I've brought up before, oh. I've talked to a couple of different people and they talk about virtual wholesaling. And I go, yeah. you guys need to make sure where are you at? What location? Because I believe from my findings that different locations, you have to act different. So you're asking another question. Lead quality sure. TV. It seems like lead quality is high there. Lead quality is high. You know what? We started our TV three months in. So okay. we did mailings first and we spent ten thousand dollars our first month on tv now we're we're spending way over 50 a month a month if not higher than that and just in minneapolis or is that everywhere nope that's just in minneapolis so there's a lot of people in the minneapolis area that's what i'm assuming with that kind of budget yeah for sure holy smokes okay so fifty thousand a month here i'll tell you this our marketing for 2024 is 1.2 that's our market budget that's your budget okay that's great so tv is about a quarter of that or no about half of that huh yeah i would say half we do so a lot of billboards we we're going to get into radio too. Are you guys mailing as well? Yeah. Mailings don't work for us as much. My guy that was in there before did a mailing where he did the, the Zillow check where they do 70% of what Zillow says. And I wish he never would have done that because we could have told them before that's never worked here before. And it just yeah. pissed off that many more people. Yeah. I just dropped a bunch of fake check letters actually that's going to be hitting this week in the Northeast out of all places. So we'll see how that works. What's actually worked for us is when we started mailing, we branded with the TV a lot more. We're putting more stuff on our mailings that have like images from the TV commercial. So people 
people can you know push them all together. Again, we do billboards, but our billboards don't have our phone number. It's just a brand recognition. Are those billboards, so are you driving them to a website or just says mnhouseguys.com? Yeah, it, it just says mnhomeguys.com. Okay. That's it. I feel like those billboards, despite not having any tracking, that's going to ultimately make your TV more profitable because people are seeing that message. Correct. That's the whole image behind it. So you progress, right? How you're really supposed to do it is it goes TV, then billboards, and then radio because then one feeds off the next and feeds off the next. And then one of the things that's a little unique that we do is if you go out there and you look at our TV commercial, we actually do all cartoons. Okay, so it's animated. It's all animated. And, and that was done for a couple of reasons. It's actually easier to transfer. So like our Knoxville guys, now we just put in the logo for them and it's the same yeah. TV commercial. And again, we've been running this TV commercial for seven years now. That's what I do with direct mail. If a postcard's working or a letter's working, I keep sending it until proven otherwise. So that's interesting. That's smart that you're doing that. You're doing the kind of the omnipresent marketing is what they would call that. So one feeds to the other. So you're doing this in Minnesota. I don't know anything about Minneapolis. Is there a lot of investors there? I don't know many people in Minneapolis really besides yourself. We have a lot of everything. So it's a little more diverse. But it seems like with that type of market, like I said, I've done business in very high-end markets as well, San Diego and New York, which is insanely expensive. The problem in the markets is that the acquisition is much harder in terms of cost and conversion. However, the sale, whether you're flipping or wholesaling or even burring for that matter is phenomenal. I'm talking like multi, multi six figure spreads sometimes. So is that the case for you guys? We didn't wholesale our first property for like year three. We were flipping everything. That's tough to do with the cash conversion cycle and the liability. I'm like the opposite. I'm like 70 wholesale, 30 flip or rental. Wholesaling's fucked up too in terms of being the middleman is not easy a lot of the times. It's a quicker path to revenue versus the flipping takes two months to buy it and then three months to sell it and you're five months out. You have no money back. What's your average on your wholesale deals? Like 30. Yeah, see, we go for big spreads. We don't go for these three, six thousand, nine. No, you go bankrupt doing that. Our new standard is 20 minimum, but normally we're making 30, 40. Thankfully, and you know, this doesn't happen a lot, but we just had one that closed for 342 net walk away. So that revenue is going to really help us out if we have any volatile months, because in markets like Minnesota, San Diego, New York, you're going to have every once in a while a home run, at least 100K spread, and sometimes even 100K wholesale, which we're working on one of those right now. So I think a big belief that new investors have is, oh, I only should make 10 grand wholesaling. I can tell you right now, new investor watching this, listening to this, it literally takes the same time and effort to make $40,000 on a wholesale deal than it does to make for it's the same exact thing same exact process same exact paperwork same exact logistics it's just the fact that you sold yourself short so i see people making that mistake and i'm mentoring someone right now just a personal friend of mine and i'm conditioning him to only think of twenty thousand dollar plus deals because i didn't start that way i was doing 5k deals when i started boy did i learn that fast once i actually started to grow the thing one of the things that i teach to anybody i go stop thinking about hey james i just want to get my first deal i want to get my first five deals i'm like hold on why don't you set a revenue goal that you need to get this much money. Instead of setting, you need to get five uh, deals or 20 deals this year, set a goal. If you want to just net 500,000, go for that goal. Don't go by the, the numbers. Go by yeah. the revenue. And it's a mindset. I learned that even with our own company because that's how we did it. They're set up per uh, quarter and they hit those goals. They get bonuses too. That's a good way to measure it too because the business is very cyclical on a month by month basis. So if you don't measure quarters, it's really tough to really see what's working and what's not working because of the way the sales cycle is here. This isn't a software company where there's MRR, monthly recurring revenue, right? January could be 500 grand and then February could be 150 grand, but then March could be 450 and then it evens out to a quarterly objective. So I'm glad you mentioned that because another thing too that I, I tell people is, listen, like the effort you're putting in today isn't going to pay you for five to six months. Your work today is an insurance policy for the revenue you're going to get in five months, especially if you're brand new, because this business has such a lagging effect in the beginning when you have no momentum. So if someone does buy a licensing deal from you, that will help them get momentum quicker because they already have infrastructure in place. But the effort you're putting in on January 1st, you will not see a dollar until April, most likely, even on a wholesale deal, because there's title issues and crazy shit that happens. I think we have very similar mindsets with really what it takes to be successful in this business and we're in similar markets. Sure. So my last question to you before we wrap the interview up, when it comes to your decision on doing a fix and flip versus doing a wholesale deal, because you guys are at scale now, how do you and your team make that decision? I can tell you how we do it, but I'd like to hear how you do it first. So what we do is we have projected revenue. It's a collaboration. So the wholesale, my dispo guy and my sales gal, they'll get together and they'll realize what's the best avenue. Who's going to make the most money in the fastest, right? I'll be honest with you. We lost probably 12 to 15 deals the end of quarter three and the first of quarter one. 
but we were flipping houses at the wrong times. Like at season or was it the market? Correct. Cycle? That is uh, exactly what I'm getting at. Rent, rentals are always typically go to April. That's why typically April, May is super busy for people wanting to buy houses because they're already getting out of their rental properties. Sure. And that's when all the rental properties, they typically start. In, and you got to remember in the snow and the weather, no one wants to move in the wintertime either. No. And nobody wants to do contracting work in the winter either. We do have seasonal. And if we don't do it at the right time, we probably should hang on to that house and wait two or three months because we're going to get a higher price. July... August, September, we're probably going to do more wholesaling. And then we'll turn around and probably start grabbing some more properties in the fall, the flip, and then put them back on the market come January, early February. And that's the cycle here. Yeah. No, I can see that, especially in the Midwest where it is inherently colder. That's interesting. You got to know your local market, right? Every market is so different. And that's why people ask me, Greg, are you nationwide? And hell no, I'm not nationwide. I'm buying in two or three areas I know extremely well for the right reasons. And I actually know people who do very well wholesaling nationwide, but it's basically a giant inside sales team. But you got to know your local markets, especially if you're flipping houses. There's a litany of reasons, but you got to know your market, your marketing channels, and you have everything so dialed in now to where you can actually license this out. So James, if people wanted to figure out if the licensing was a fit for them, number one, what's the best way for them to find out information about that? And then number two, how can they get in touch with you if they want to connect with you after they hear this podcast? I would just uh, reach out to myself. You can email me at james at homeguysmn.com or give me a call. The phone is always open. My number is 612-363-1521. Sweet. We'll uh, put that in the show notes there. And do you have any parting words for the audience on beginners? We got a lot of advanced people listening to this. Any parting words you have for people before we end this conversation? Do the right thing and the money will follow. I love that. Because that was such a good statement, I'm going to just give you evidence that works. So I have a tenant. She's always late on rent, which is okay. She's like a single mom. I have no problem helping her out. And she called me two weeks ago. She's like, hey, Greg, I paid the rent late, but you got the check already. What's your Zelle information for the late fee? I said, you know what? Don't send me the money for the late fee. It's like 50 bucks. I'm like, just keep it. Use it for whatever you want. And you don't have to worry about it. And she's super grateful for that, which is the right thing, like you mentioned. And then I think the next day we had our biggest deal ever close net profit wise. It's karma, man. You do the right thing and it comes back around. You treat people, you do what you say you're going to do. You're honest about your intentions with deals. So when you do the right thing, the money absolutely follows. I appreciate you uh, being a guest on my show today. We'll make sure that contact information is in. And uh, man, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.